everyone to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton, the series director. Today we present artist, writer, and activist Suzanne Lacey. Uh, thank you to our partners for their support today, the Institute for the Humanities, the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, the University of Michigan Museum of Art and Arts Engine. Uh, I just have two brief announcements for you today uh, before we get started. One of them is just the hottest tip. The hottest tip for everyone here, just in case you did not already see it yourself. There is an incredible novel length article about the history of this here fair, Michigan Theater, which came out this morning on MLive, uh, or what's left of the Ann Arbor News. Uh, thanks to the diligence of uh, reporter Ryan Stanton, amazing to know there is a real live reporter working for MLive, uh, and his diligence to tell this incredible behemoth of a story. He tells the whole story from the laying of the first cornerstone to 40 years ago when the theater almost was hit by the wrecking ball and taken down and the amazing people behind saving uh, this space where we find ourselves today. Uh, most appropriately, I'm not gonna ruin the whole story for you and it's a great read and you must check it out. The crux of the whole story comes down to a bluff and an organist. How appropriate is that? Henry Aldridge, uh, one of the, or still an organist here, at the time was part of the Organ Society. This is 40 years ago when the theater was gonna be torn down. Uh, and he went to the then Ann Arbor mayor, uh, Lou Belker, and convinced him to get involved because the theater was going to become a food court. Uh, so uh, the mayor then bluffed uh, and offered more than the de uh, developers that were buying it for the food court, even though he didn't have the money to buy it. So I'll leave the rest to your reading. Go to MLive, the, the, the title I think was something about Michigan theater and 40 years being saved from the wrecking ball. Check it out. Just for the photographs, there are incredible, like a whole, like 50 photographs uh, attached to this article that are all archival photos. So. Don't miss it. Uh, reminder today, the gratitude table is in the lobby and we have students Sam Ploof and Miles Honus helping facilitate. This is the next to last time that we're gonna have the gratitude station. Uh, this is in the wake of losing our patroness Penny last December. Uh, we've taken this fall season to gather your thoughts around the series and the impact of Penny's vision which is still bringing us together today. And we ask that you share your reflections and ideas about the series uh, on the stationery provided or bring your own or take some home. Next week will be the last time we're collecting letters here at the theater. Uh, so, you know, take some stationery home and, and compose your thoughts and bring them back next week or you can always throw it in the mail to me uh, up at the stamp school too. Uh, because, you know, we wanna hear about anything, you know, what, what is it to you? Just a place to gather your thoughts on a Thursday for a good dinner conversation or a speaker that's moved you, some eureka moment that you've had, or how it hasn't moved you too. We wanna to hear those too. Uh, so do remember to silence your cell phones. Uh, we are going to have our regular Q&A today. This will be in the screening room. So join us directly following the presentation here. You can exit through the doors, go left down the corridor to the screening room. Uh, there are also, we have Nicola's books in the lobby with some of Suzanne Lacey's book. Uh, I can't remember the title, I'm so sorry, I didn't write it down. I should, it was, it, it's a great book, you should check it out. And if you want to get it signed, then you should come to the Q&A, and Suzanne has agreed that she will take time to sign some books after the Q&A. So now to properly introduce our guest, uh, we have Irina Aristarkova. She is an assistant professor in the Stamp School of Art and Design. Many of you will recall, uh, Irina was the force behind the Lucy Lepard and Faith Wilding event that we had last month. Uh, her new book, Arrested Welcome, Hospitality in Contemporary Art, will come out from Minnesota University Press in the spring. Please welcome Irina Aristarkova. Hello, how is everyone? Great. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today Suzanne Lacey. 
Suzanne Lacey is a key figure in founding of what's become known by various terms, such as community art, socially engaged art, social practice, as well as contemporary and feminist performance art. By the way, I wanted Suzanne Lacey to know that another recent visitor to the STEMS lecture series, Lucy Lippard, who was here about a month ago in conversation with Faith Walding, told us that she was wearing her shoes on stage. If it is correct, a part of you was here a month ago in Lucy Lippard's shoes. Now we are very happy to have the whole of Suzanne Lacey here. Suzanne Lacey exhibited at Tate Modern in London, the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the New Museum in New York, MoMA PS1, and in Bilbao, Spain, among many other venues. She was a Dean of Fine Arts at California College of the Arts for a decade from 87 to 97, and the founding chair of the MFA program in public practice at the Otis College of Art and Design. She is currently teaching at the University of Southern California Roski School of Art and Design. In 1969, at California State University Fresno, Suzanne Lacey joined Faith Wilding to start the first feminist consciousness raising group on American campus. As one of the founders of the feminist art movement, Lacey also pioneered using performance as a pedagogical tool and art form in its own right. In doing more research uh, for this introduction, I discovered that Suzanne Lacey used to offer a workshop called SAC, Stop Artistic Constipation. <laughs> and I want to hear more about that during the Q&A. The syllabus taught strategies of helping to generate creative energy and ideas. Similar to our students and stamps, Suzanne Lacey had truly interdisciplinary interests as a student. With graduate training in psychology and undergraduate training in pre-medical and zoological sciences. And in fact, her MFA at CalArts was in social design. In one of the interviews, she said that she wanted to become a shrink before becoming an artist. And I think she is a kind of a shrink as a social designer and artist, just to many more, thousands, in fact, people. Lacey's work in social practice, community organizing, performance, video, photography, and installation have been gathered together this summer for a major retrospective called Suzanne Lacey, We Are Here, and co-organized by Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. To get a sense of the scope of Lacey's work, I encourage you to read a beautiful catalog from this exhibition titled We Are Here, with contributions by Lucy Lippard and Alan Capro, among others. And you can buy this catalog even on, online at the Target Shop website. I was very happy to see how widely it's distributed. For the school like stamps, Lacey's practice is particularly important, as many of you here our students, faculty, staff, and community members see yourselves as agents of change. And you define for yourself what change means to you as reflected in courses you take, where you put your energy, conversations you have on campus, and your future professional career paths. And this connects me to what I personally appreciate about Suzanne Lacey's both intimate and very large-scale projects. They translate our individual angst into collective energy and a sense of optimism for the present, for our shared power now. You bring us together, Suzanne Lacey. Please join me in welcoming Suzanne Lacey. Thank you, Irina. And I'm extremely happy to be here. This is quite a class act, this um, series of lectures. And I'm excited that I'm following in the heels of people like Marina Abramovic, Faith Wilding, and Lauren Bond, all of whom are friends to one degree or the other. And indeed, I stand here in, uh, as we all do, in Lucy Lepard's shoes. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, 
um, Michelle in the back to raise the house lights for a minute. Sort of want to know who I'm talking to. Uh, there you are. So, how many of you are students? Stand up. Stand up. Oh, wow. That's fabulous. Good. So I know who I'm talking to. Now, how many of you are members of this specific community and no longer in school? Potentially teachers. Stand up. Wow. The stalwart organizers, I bet. The community organizers among us. Um, thank you for coming and, and thank you, Michelle, for raising the house lights. So I want to start in a couple of ways. Uh, I want to say first, I appreciate the opportunity to tell a different story here tonight. Um, when I got Christina's notice about the th questions that she wanted me to answer, uh, I was kind of intimidated because I don't normally talk about myself. Um, I'm interested in my work and other people's stories and how personal narrative fits into larger political narratives. Um, but I, I took, of course, I did exactly what she told me to do. I thought about how to tell my story from my personal point of view. And um, I want to start by uh, talking about how I entered art. But before I do that, I want us to remember that right northeast of CalArts, which is the time I entered art, the place I entered art, in Santa Clarita today, Saugus High School was um, the victim or was the site of another mass murder. Uh, so far, two people are dead, and um, I am still live in Los Angeles, so I'm, I feel, as I do whenever there is um, a, a, a school shooting that, and, and you guys are the ones that are going to stop it, you know, frankly, that we have failed you by allowing this to happen, we being my generation, and in many ways we have, and it really is up to you guys to carry on the work of the, the, the activists among us who are still standing. Um, when I was the age of many of you, most of you, college in California was free. It was the result of political policy that suggested that every working class kid, black kid, Latino, Latinx, women, were able to go to college in uh, either to a junior state or university in California. And California at that point had excellent education at the higher education level. Um, we then came out of um, university several years later, around the early 70s, and we were the products of Cesar Chavez farm worker movement, the Vietnam War, civil rights movement before that, the origins of feminism, the free speech movement, Black Panthers, and the economic forces that have continued to this day and finally demolished the middle class in this country. I was going to medical school on the way. I was a grad student in psychology. I wanted to be a shrink. And I'd gotten my first degree in zoology. And then at Fresno State, I met Judy Chicago, took a strong right turn, and ended up at CalArts. Um, based on my class and gender, I was a bit of an outsider. So I'm going to tell this story about social practice in terms of my practice in decades. So in the 70s, the kind of training that we had in ish political issues and community issues really came from the street. Uh, it was everywhere. You, it was very hard to not stumble onto a, non a Gandhian nonviolence protest movement or a farm worker movement or a Vietnam War bank burning or some kind of political activity. And we learned things like coalition building, which I think is a, is a strategy that needs to be reprieved today. At CalArts, I was not educated in professional art. This is the opening of my exhibition, and right at the beginning is the yard sale, which talks about selling, trading, um, trading clothes, selling 
uh, things out of your garage to other people in a small rural community, which is the kind of community I came from. I was not educated in professional art. I was a feminist. And at that point in time, to be a feminist was extremely derided. It was quite a negative thing. You know, we were supposed to grow hair on our legs and under our armpits and, and uh, hate men. Um, I was also female at a time when, in all fields, women struggled for recognition. When I was thinking about medical school, I knew I would have a high bar because, in fact, there was a percentage of women, it was between 8 and 12 percent of women that were allowed into medical school every year. Of course, imagine the art world. When you look at art of the 60s and 70s, only now are you beginning to see, well, I'd say 50s and 60s, only now are you beginning to see a lot more uh, prolific expression of women artists. So I was um, in CalArts also as a working class person in a school that was largely upper middle class, uh, large or uh, above. And uh, so I was, I was an outsider and I was interested in these kinds of issues like yard sale and that's my sister back there in the red. This project um, which has clothing in front also has statistics about um, the economy during the recession in uh, 2008 and 9. At the time that I entered CalArts, I was thinking about social practice, but we didn't call it social practice. To begin with, I was process and performance oriented at a moment when those kinds of fields were just developing. Because I came in with a political background, interested in social issues, um, I was more interested in that than I was in material. So this kind of, Lucy's at the vanguard of, and Alan Capra, who I've worked with in Judy Chicago, they're sort of at the vanguard of this movement wherein people began to work in performative forms as a full-time occupation uh, of artists. Painting was dead, so we said, uh, to great drama in the art world. And the outdoor world was just a whole lot more exciting. So we moved art outside. We explored unusual audiences, non-traditional spaces, and so on. Now, when I was coming of age from CalArts, museums and galleries are not what they are today. For the grad students here among you, there's a kind of an onus of entering the art world and how are you going to survive? And we actually didn't even think about that. It was cheaper to live. I actually lived as a, a carpenter for several years after I got out of school. So for me, uh, galleries and museums like this piece, Prostitution Notes, that was a place to address people. But so was television. So was the news media. Those were all requiring different kinds of language, different kinds of thinking, and different, potentially even different messages. But at the core, these works were largely experimental, performative, and that allowed social issues to come to the fore. In three weeks in May, I worked with a team of other artists to develop a series of 30 different events over the course of three weeks, in, from guerrilla events like this to um, uh, city council meetings, to meetings with police officers, to speak out, self-defense training. And all of these, what we today would call a platform, all of these activities I framed as a kind of a lifelike art from my uh, teacher Capro. And in the center of this was a great map in the City Hall Mall, um, several, uh, um, you know, two large maps. On one, every day I went to the police department, got statistics of exactly where women were raped the day before, and I stuck them on the map. I did um, stamps for those people who were not, we, we calculated at the time, nine out of 10 did not report their rapes. And at the other map was one which showed where you could go for help and the, the burgeoning um, organizations dealing with this issue. This is 1977. 
This is women of color speaking about the particular issues of, of their community um, on a radio program. These are performances, this one by Leslie Labowitz, by myself, and a, a lot of public events that engaged interdisciplinary people like, like um, city hall people, uh, professors, but more importantly, community organizations. So at that point in time, um, this kind of work was developing, not just alongside, but in the context of performance art in California. So moving forward quickly, it's now entering the 80s. And in the 80s, politics took a more um, conservative turn, Reagan, Thatcher in England, um, the market, art market developed a little, began to develop. There was a dramatic shift in number of students who were going into MFA programs. Uh, when I came out of uh, graduate school from CalArts around 73, uh, there weren't a lot as many artists in the world. Simply, we could go to Germany and meet Joseph Boyce. It was not, uh, it was a small informal uh, community, particularly among people exploring new ideas in art. Um, but e in spite of this conservatism, um, museums began to become more and more populist, and they began to be, you know, the idea of the audience started opening up. Another thing was happening, very important, the, the prominent movements of the 70s like feminism, like um, anti-racism, began, continued their work. And in their work, they were continuing a kind of a grassroots activist approach that, that has set the stage for where we're at today. Today, Me Too is, stands on the shoulders of the activists, the anti-violence activists of the 70s, people who wrote like Susan Brown Miller, people like Patty Giggins who started what is now Peace Over Violence, but 45 years ago was the first rape hotline that I know of, certainly in Los Angeles. So the, the debates that we're having now, uh, and, and this is something that's of deep importance to me and hope, I hope we cover it or begin to talk about it in the, um, in the conversation after. These, these questions that we're dealing with now, the groundwork was laid in the 60s and 70s in this country. And um, we stood, as we do with Lucy Lepard, on the shoulder of others. Now in the art, artists were doing the same thing. And, as late as the mid-90s, I convened a series of 45 of the biggest who's who in social practice at that time in San Francisco. This is my colleague Chris Johnson, the photographer, who stood up and um, gave very quick, at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, very quick, punchy comments. Alan Capra was among them, Lucy Lepard, Susie Gablick, uh, and so on comments about where we were at now in terms of social practice. We met, that's Merle uh, Euclid, um and Patty Phillips and other people, you might or might Mary Jane Jacob. We met afterwards at a three-day repeat and uh, retreat and we um, hatched Mapping the Terrain, New Genre Public Art, which was a series of essays that attempted to reframe the way people saw public art because at that point in time, public art was quite materials-based. The murals that were happening by people like Judy Baca in the communities were not seen as art, or at least high art. But public art uh, was moving into the foreground, and we wanted to say, look, public art is about public issues and public audiences. So through the 80s, I began to develop this form of multivocality which supports the idea of individual personal narratives done collectively as having a sort of a different meaning than an individual narrative. I studied news media a lot. I was very interested in how media shaped opinion. I'm still quite interested in that. and. Um, 
I wanted to know how operating both within and outside of mass media, because my works always have both of those components, how you would begin to bring forward the intersectionality that um, is so critical to the issue of oppression. So this is in 1982 and meeting in um, around the um, city in San Francisco, we decided to create uh, a, an, an event in a furniture showroom that featured around 19 different groups of women sitting in uh, kind of a, 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 an arrangement, whatever the arrangement was that seemed to fit the women and they wanted to work. And these are women in padded chairs who have been uh, institutionalized for mental illness. And they have um, on their table, they have a big bottle of Thorazine each, I asked each group to bring something that represented who they are. And they're simply talking about the issue of survival. Older black women, women non-traditional workers. I was interested in making sure lesbians had a voice and they decided to frame themselves as non-traditional workers. This is my mother's bridge game from Wasco, California, the middle of the state. These are Filipina women in San Francisco, nuns, sex workers with a mask, a purse, and a couple of hundred dollar bills peeking out. Older women, uh, Jewish women, for whom survivors was a very different kind of word. Business women and uh, women, uh, disabled women. And so these women um, met together in this uh, performative space with an audience that could walk through and overhear the women talking informally around script, not scripted, sculpted conversation. The difference being they decide what they want to talk about and how they want to talk about it, but there is a shape to the conversation. Actually, recently in the exhibition at SF MoMA, we closed it with inviting several of those women back since we were doing it in San Francisco. And um, they were there and we filmed it. I'm just doing a small film on it. Uh, I want to talk now about um, the crystal quilt in Minneapolis, um, and uh, this was in 1987, so I'm going to leap around here and then I'm going to show you a quick two-minute video because I think it's very important for you to hear the people I speak to, not simply me. But um, I, I was interested in the way the media portrayed older women, so one of the aspects of this three-year project in Minneapolis was to train older women to address media, to be in the media. We actually taught them how to develop press kits, women through across Minneapolis, and to insert their images, their ideas, their leadership in um, in public media, because at that moment in time, older women were the least represented um, kind of category in, uh, in media. And we worked for a year with the Humphrey Institute, developing a leadership seminar for 30 women from around the state. Uh, and out of that came a group of, of women who worked with me for another year to develop a performance. And this is Meredel Lassour, who you might know since she's a Midwestern uh, writer, political activist. She and 429 other women arrived on Mother's Day at in uh, the Crystal Court in Minneapolis and on this quilt designed by Miriam Shapiro, they um, had a performance where the audience could hear recordings and they talked about issues not from their past, but issues they were looking forward to. The Whisper Minnesota Project is a, on one hand it's a conceptual artwork, a series of activities that has taken place in a community for two and a half years, culminating with a theatrical sort of special, which is the Crystal Quilt performance. On the other hand, it's a complex community action, a bringing together of a players from a variety of arenas to focus on an issue, and the issue is, how do we think of older women? How do older women think of themselves? We were sharing uh, the common thread of being older women, sitting there, very proud, 
with uh, wrinkles and circles under her eyes, and gray hair, and still feeling very, very beautiful and special. My name is Hazel Cherney, and I'm 75 years young. My name is Elsie Gobranson, and I live in Proctor. And, and the hope that maybe this will increase um, the influence of, I'll, I'll call them female values, um, cooperation rather than competition, um, being willing to um, work with impermanent things. Marjorie Cobb, I think a lot of senility comes from the fact that nobody asks you anything. Or you, you know, nobody can, includes you in, in the social uh, uh, ceremonials. Nobody asks you about your, to speak. And you, pretty soon you lose your memory. Or nobody listens. I suffer a lot from people not listening to me. It's like not having a great aged tree to sit under. Uh, you know, to protect you, or to look at, or to feel. I think it's a great cultural loss. Again, I'm just showing you a few snippets of different projects through these decades, and this one is uh, 10 years of work in Oakland, California, uh, where I was teaching. Um, I was quite educated by Oakland. Oakland is not unlike Detroit, and it's um, got some significant differences. Uh, but Oakland is a very black community. Um, and in the school system, I think at the time, it was something like 50% African American, 20% uh, Latino, 20% Asian. This is public schools. And at that point, I began to wonder, Chris Johnson, the man that was standing up and I, who were both teaching together, and we began to wonder, who were those kids that were hanging out on the street corners? And they were so kind of um, boisterous and wonderful, um, so uh, enthusiastic about the way they were relating to each other. And yet we could see that schools like our school was saying, oops, got to be careful of these kids, got to lock the gates when they're nearby. And we started under, trying to understand why that might be, what was going on. And as we began to work in um, public uh, media theory and look closely at the policies that were developing, we could see that throughout the 90s, and we started this at the beginning of the 90s, which is when a lot of this kind of anti-youth culture, anti-youth policies begun to um, draw, you know, take, um, take on more and more uh, fury in the news media. California also was a place where, you know, the population is now, I think, almost or has reached 50% Latino. So it was a growing working class uh, uh, culture with a lot of ethnic diversity. And at the same time, the policies in California were sort of diverging so that, that older white people were, because of issues, you know, different policies, older white people were creating more of the money. Money was leaving public systems that normally would support youth, including uh, education. And Chris and I were interested, and this was being reflected in the media with the ideas of the predator youth and so on. And Chris and I were very interested in how we might um, begin to interrogate this, to learn from people in the community and to learn from young people. So we actually began teaching in a local high school with some high school teachers for the first year of the project. And at the end of it, we did a performance where we got about 30 of these young people to begin speaking publicly to each other, uh, to each other, but in public, so people could begin to understand who these young people, these children were. This is uh, by Unique Holland, uh, who was 15 when I met her. She's now 40, as are many of the people in the first of these projects called Roof is on Fire. And um, Unique, that's Lucisha Spencer, but Unique designed this installation for the exhibition we just had in Yerba Buena. 
And she began to work with us, as did many of the students we continued to work with when she was 15 at Oakland Tech. So in California, the convergence of increasing so-called minority, increasing um, social disparity, and youth becoming a very public figure to point to in terms of increasing police presence, welfare reform, and so on, uh, we began to do these projects that included over workshops for over a thousand young people over the 10 years we worked in probation departments. We did all kinds of projects in schools, outside of schools, and so on. And every once in a while, we would have a large public spectacle performance where we would give young people an opportunity to be um, to, to speak publicly about the issues that they care about. This is Roof is on Fire in 1994. It got national media attention and um, became kind of a platform for listening to young people talk about issues they themselves decided they wanted to talk about. Again, sculpted conversation. We worked for a half a year with young people in planning teams who um, developed the questions and, and um, basically helped design the performance. And on the night of the performance, um, a thousand people showed up to listen to 220 kids sit in cars and talk about sex, about families, about violence, about school, and so on. We also worked with young women. Uh, I'm only going to show you a couple of what amounts to seven or eight projects. We worked with young women to create um, a, a summer class for credit. It's the first and last time I will ever develop a, a child care center. Um, and these are young, uh, 30 young pregnant and parenting people who um, worked with us for in the arts um, over six, a six week period of time. They came every day. They brought their children to the daycare center. We together, 15 of them worked with me and Unique and other people. And we created this gigantic crib that you see uh, in the middle of a space in downtown San Francisco. And as you squeeze around this crib, you see these um, drawings that the girls made very large that we reduced. Uh, and they're very graphic, very narrative, and, and really, really quite beautiful. When you went around to the back, you see the blackboard there, or the green board in the back, and you climbed up into this giant crib, and inside you see a jumbled classroom. That's the current governor at that moment in time, Pete Wilson, and he had led the Welfare Reform Act, which used teen pregnancy as a kind of a, foot, a media football in order to get um, California to enact uh, welfare, so-called welfare reform, which, uh, as you may not know, but in the mid-'90s uh, became quite draconian um, and he was passing the, the state uh, version of it. And he's there silent. You can hear his voice outside the crib. And inside you see him and legislators kind of slow-mo. Everything's unique design, this video. And, but you can hear all of these earphones. You can hear from the young women who were part of this project. Um, they graduated from the program and received their six units. A few years later, after a couple of um, years of prep, we worked with Oakland Police Department to develop uh, Code 33, Emergency Clear the Air. And this was a project with uh, Oakland Police that put young people and police in carefully facilitated groups after having gone through a series of trainings together um, and asked them to just comment on, the, uh, on their relationships with each other and, and their work. And um, there was you know, dancing and community feedback and so on. And I'm going to now show a two minute video from that project. I've had a single positive experience in my life. So I'm going to tell you the truth. I couldn't be around police 
Well, my stomach's turning. In 10 years as a police officer, I have never seen a police officer hit a person that's been handcuffed. I'm not saying that that does not happen. I, obviously, it happens, but I have never seen it. It happened in Riverside to a young girl. What are you talking about that never happened? I get shot down. I get shot down. Now, because you're a cop and because you made a mistake that I was reaching for something and because you ran my name and four years ago, I have something on my record. I got shot and it's okay. You may not even lose your job. That's how you're above the law. And you can't, and you have to admit that. Let me give you an example. A decorated cop, all right? 15 years in the force, kicking ass. The whole 15 years kicking he's on. Kicking ass the whole 15 years. That's Meaning he's I'm been making, about. hey, that's right. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a good cop. I didn't say he was uh, uh, doing anything against him. I'm talking about a good cop. 15 years on the streets, all right? Everybody knows him. Everybody likes him in the apartment. Citizens like him. He goes out there and makes a mistake like that. What do you think should happen to him? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. That's your attitude, though. Hey, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. A good cop like that that probably has 10 more years on the streets, he makes one freaking mistake. That's how people are. Screw him, get him out of there. 15 years on the street kicking ass, whatever, right? He makes one mistake, but we're on the streets, and we make one mistake, and what happens to us? Make one mistake, meaning what? One, uh, one mistake about what? 25, you were hell. I, I don't understand what you mean. Like, breaking she's the law. saying if, if young people break the law, they don't get a second chance. That, that's not true. That, that is not that's true. Not young, especially not, especially young. not young. That is not, not true at all. True. We just got done. We so got here late here on a, on, a, on a case where a guy just paroled after doing, a, what, three years for murder. He did three years for murder. Okay. So there are second chances. Okay, so um, we are halfway through our talk, and I wanted to spend a little bit more time talking about three of my um, more recent projects during 2000 teens and uh, just yeah 2000 teens. And and um, one of the questions that I so appreciated that Christina asked is, uh, what are you passionate about right now? And I, I, I'm simultaneously passionate about politics, and that means electoral politics. I'm passionate about how oppression operates around the world and how to fight oppression of all kinds. Um, I'm also passionate about art and changing um, the form language and making art in, in a very sophisticated way respond to both social issues, community engagement, and um, the, the, the kind of aesthetics of, a, of an art practice. And hence, we now come to the idea of social practice. And it is, as, as you probably know, those of you who even know what, what that word is, um, social practice is a very nebulous field. It is something that sort of loosely explains people who engage outside of galleries, but it can encompass people like Tino Segal, I suppose, who works within museums, or Pablo Elguerra, um, or Tanya Bruguera. It, um, it encompasses people like the Yes Men who do their work out in the world and show it in museums. It encompasses people you've never heard of who are artists, like um, the Carolyn Leclerc from the Deck Collective. Well, you may have heard of her by now, but uh, Carolyn was part of a group of people who were very, came out of New York and the, um, the um, uh, you know, movements there. There's uh, a lot of people who aren't really sure they want to be part of the art world and the art, but they're trained as artists. They're very interested, ultimately, in aesthetic ideas. So social practice, which has a variety of theories and postulations, some of which seem to be kind of out of our reach. It's got practices that draw from people like Saul Alinsky in the community. And um, so right now, it's kind of a, a territory of, uh, of great um, discovery. In the 90s, we are doing kind of similar things to what we did in the 70s, um, only different. Uh, we are 
concerned with guns. We are concerned with Brexit. I just recently finished a project on Brexit and how Brexit represents a kind of increasing global nationalization uh, uh, <clears throat> and um, or rise of nationalism, I should say, globally, uh, about how fundamental religion impacts po the political sphere. Um, and, and we find ourselves, I think, sometimes, those of us like myself who've been working for a very long time, slightly depressed um, until, uh, really, until we start talking to younger people. Now, you guys have got a challenge. You are growing up in a very different kind of environment, but I think it's worth it for us to, which is why I continue to teach, for us to really think together about how your ideas and your experiences can inform me and how my um, skill sets can be supportive to you. Um, in the 90s, one of the issues, I mean, excuse me, in the 2000 teens, one of the issues um, that I think is, is really interesting is what is feminism today? Um, I, I still find recently a, a young Korean student who came from a monoculture of Korea, who's more or less monoculture, who said to me, why, um, I don't understand, I'm, interested in feminism and in Korea, that has a very specific resonance. But here in the United States, it's a very different resonance. And one of the problems with feminism has been handed down to a lot of you as white, middle-class, intellectual, college-educated women. And while I may be white, now middle-class, college-educated, I am solidly in the camp of being a working-class person, sympathetic to the working class, and um, a, deeply my entire life having been concerned with issues of race and violence for all people, men and women, and um, a kind of how, how do you become globally response, a globally responsive citizen and person. This is in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Creative Time asked me to develop uh, a, a project looking at what, what uh, feminism is today. So what we did is organized, um, it was a very complex organizing project because Creative Time had a lot of white people on its staff. I said you must hire a producer that's a woman of color and you must hire or stipend 10 young women who are going to go and organize each 10 organizations. So there's 100 organizations that we are going to target throughout the greater New York area, and they will participate with us in a very uh, elaborate intersectional performance along an entire block of Brooklyn. And the video sort of shows this that I'm gonna show you. So um, the audience came in and they were able to listen over the course of an hour. They could de design their own narrative, essentially, from the many collective, many M-I-N-I, -I, collective narratives that were developing within each stoop group. Um, and they then, at the very end of the evening, um, I guess is that, that must be the video. I'll see, yeah. <laughs> We're re-strategizing. Can you guys gather over here for a minute? We're going to talk about sweeping so, the way tape. And then we're going to slowly be kind of coming out. Tablecloth, and then they're going to peel off to the right, walk all the way back down. I think they're doing something with women and poverty. That's what I believe. Yeah, so. feminism. No, no. about this project is how many of you have come together to construct it. This is a symbolic gesture. Whatever you feel, whatever you want to say, that is completely up to you.
great. It was very like he was like still like very tough love, but very gentle with me. And like oh, because you're a girl, you can cry, and that's okay. But now that I'm like no, daddy, I'm queer, and I don't really I embrace both genders. It's like very like oh, you don't need to cry. Like suck that up, you know. It's very like it's more like. Hot. I've been accustomed to hearing men say hi gorgeous and I say hi, I just know they're talking to me. He said hi gorgeous, my goddaughter said hi. I'm like, what? I'm middle aged now. Oh, I this is what you see on the news after there's a domestic violence homicide all the time. I had no idea. He seems so nice. It's because their issue is not anger management. It's power. It's control. Like, it's sometimes coercion. I should like asking my mom some things that I don't know. But maybe I cannot ask her because she don't know nothing about us. She didn't go to school. piece of me. I'm right. like, talk to me like I'm your daughter or your sister or your mother. Don't talk to me like I'm your next. What, do, what is something you want for your daughter's education? It could be the same. I wanted to assimilate so much and I wanted to blend in so the bad. of the victim isn't taken into account because then you're not tough on crime. Your body right. doesn't no, feel young, no, no. but your soul feels young. Oh, yeah. How do we bring right. to light right. the feminization of poverty? You know, it's not every day that we shut down our city blocks for things other than tube socks and Italian sausages. So to do something that really has a profound transformation of our individual lives and our collective lives, I think is very exciting for people. What you see here is the result of extensive relationships that at its fruition are these 400 people having a conversation. And so in many ways, the project's in some ways already finished by the time that the people come to see it. One of the groups we worked with on this project was the people who lived on that block. There were um, 360 women over 60 groups, uh, actually 360 people. There were actually quite a few men uh, involved with this group, but we asked each group to address notions of gender and other forms of activism to uh, sort of demonstrate how this collective narrative is so rich today and how coalition is such an, a critical strategy to learn. This is a very different kind of project uh, in Ecuador. Uh, I worked there for a couple of years in uh, Quito and was asked to work on the issue of violence against women. Uh, when I got there, I knew that I found out there was a project that a nonprofit had done that involved women, 10,000 women over the entire country writing letters that described the violence, the family violence they had experienced and putting them in a big uh, archive that became uh, important in that culture. And one of the things I'm, I'm sensitive or try to be sensitive to, particularly uh, when traveling and working, which I've done a lot in um, South America, is the way that um, we, uh, as the United States, represent a, a, a very uh, imperialist, long-term domination and uh, af effectiveness uh, at, at um, shifting uh, the, the work of activism and, in fact, uh, fighting against it in those countries. And in this case, I thought it was important to acknowledge, to nod to, to build on this project, but I wasn't really interested in doing another letter writing project. Again, this has to do with art and formal ideas of art. I had sort of been there and done that and wanted to do something more experimental. And over lunch one day, a group of women planners were complaining about their boyfriends. And um, we sort of suddenly looked at each other and said, well, well, wait a minute, maybe we should do something that is really a performance with and about men. So at that point in time down there, academics and in New York and around were beginning to look at this notion of 
what you now call toxic masculinity. This is, I think, around 2014, something like that. And we um, convened workshops uh, run by men. Uh, my colleague, Tim Kroger, who worked with nonprofits on this issue, uh, we can, you know, did these all over the city. We found a production site for the project we organized within universities, um, the city. Uh, this was a project of the city we organized with nonprofits and uh, culture, political cultural collaboratives. And um, a lot of it was about increasing the dialogue uh, in these workshops, the dialogue about how violence impacts men, um, and both in terms of those who do violence, but also a, a good number of men, given the incidence of domestic violence, has, have also experienced that kind of family violence. And um, so we, um, in each of these workshops, we gave people a real letter written by a woman in Ecuador, and um, they were going to read it. And this, in the middle of this performance that I'm about to show you, and this is uh, the night of the performance, and the first level you see here is the directing level, then there's an audience level, and then there's a, a performer level. And if you'll look in this, you'll see that the movement between the audience and the performers is very uh, important. So the piece begins. Muchas personas dicen que sus recuerdos de infancia son los más bellos. Recuerdan sus juegos y alegrías. Mis recuerdos son diferentes. Cierta tarde, un hombre bonachón me dijo que me llevaría a tomar helados. Pero en vez de eso, me besó con fuerza. Me levantó la pequeña falda del uniforme e introdujo sus dedos en mí. Cuando yo tenía seis años, vi como mi papá pegó a mi hermano mayor. Le pegó tan fuerte que no pudo dormir en la noche del dolor que sentía de los golpes. Decía que tenía un hueso roto. Un día, la madre llegó temprano y observó a su esposo manoseando a su hijita pequeña. Ella no dijo nada por temor a perder a su marido o miedo de qué dirán. Yo me despertaba vomitando sangre. Me pegaba con correa militar. Me rompí el cuerpo a correazos. Cansada de tanto golpe, tomé veneno porque ya no soportaba más. Pero están dispuestos de ellos a trabajar, a mirarse en su propio dolor, en la historia de violencia del que ellos también fueron víctimas, y hacer algo. Los niños aún duermen. Espero que anoche no hayan oído los golpes secos que me diste para ahogar esa rabia que te inundaba. Porque tú lo dices siempre, sin ti no soy nada. Pero me pregunto, ¿qué soy yo a tu lado? Ya eran las 7 de la noche, hora en la que se supone que mi marido llegaba. Él había llegado borracho con sus amigos y me empezó a maltratar. Y entre todos me empezaron a tocar y luego a pegar. Cuando intenté tomar el teléfono, ya era muy tarde. Estaba siendo violada por los amigos de mi esposo. La primera bala la recibí en el estómago, pero fue la única que pudo ser. No queden impunes. Me casé hace 54 años. Sufría maltrato verbal y físico durante todos estos años. Y ahora, en mi vejez, tuve el valor para dejarle. No importa quién es el receptor de una carta, cuando todos somos depositarios y autores de estas palabras, que al juntarse, al significarse unas con otras, se encarnan y forman el cuerpo de hombres, niñas y mujeres. ¿Quién entonces se lleva la autoría de los cuerpos que cargan con toda esta violencia? El recuerdo es en carne viva. Está en mí, está en mi cuerpo, es lo que soy. Está en cada una de estas palabras.
¿Puedo leerte mi carta? ¿Te puedo leer mi carta? ¿Me permites leerte mi carta? So this piece is essentially about allowing a space performatively for over 300 men, but symbolically all men, to enter into this discourse. I think that on the topic of violence against women, um, the, the, one of the issues that arises is that those men that don't beat up women don't really know what their place is in this conversation often, although I do think that's changing. And those men who do beat up women and children um, uh, don't really want to talk about it. So the idea of this performance and the performers owning a letter and empathically identifying with women and then who had experienced violence and then moving into the audience to read the letter and this sort of movement back and forth between the performer and the audience was about this public, um, the possibility of this public discourse. I want to end with um, The Circle and the Square, which is a piece uh, that I finished around 2018, I think, and um, although I'm going back and I continue to have relationships very long term with the people that I work with, uh, not all of them, of course, but some, and this is in the mill area of uh, Man uh, above north of Manchester. It's northwestern England, and that is a place that is... Um, one of the more impoverished areas of England. It's a place where in the 60s, um, they Im imported a lot of immigrants from Pakistan who knew how to work in textile mills. And there was for a good period of time from the 60s, kind of ups and downs, but through early 90s, there was a very robust middle working class economy that developed where people from Pakistan who were Muslims worked on a daily basis with people, uh, white people, uh, Christians, uh, and, and the cultures, you wouldn't say they were similar, white people didn't go to, or white slash Christian people didn't really go to mosques, and Muslim Pakistani people didn't really go to uh, bars, but there was a, 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 this, throughout their working days, this um, kind of camaraderie and relationality that, I, I don't want to make it romantic, like there was no racism because that's not the case, but there was a beginning of a comfort level um, between uh, these groups and a respect. And when I went to, um, Briarfield, which is a small town that's about 50% Pakistani uh, heritage, some recent immigrants and some, uh, but a lot of people who'd lived there, like Ralph Bashir here, who, whose family had worked the mills. Um, I, I saw how disparate the communities were. There was no common place that they came together. People like Ralph were working on community building um, but that was rare. Uh, the place is, is impoverished uh, in terms of the jobs all left in the early 90s and went to some other country. Um, and uh, now there's a lot of people driving, uh, you know, Uber-type cars, taxis, and working in fast food restaurants and so on. A lot of young people leave this area because there's not a future for them. And we began to work with first 
interviewing people who had worked in the mills, and this is Mao Malona from uh, London, an anthropologist, and we're interviewing former mill workers. We ultimately um, worked with over, uh, gosh, over um, 75 interviews, short interviews. We also began potluck dinners and brought together, I was very, um, stressed very much the idea that we couldn't have tokenism, that if you were gonna have a potluck dinner building to a performance, it had to be 50-50 uh, people representing these different cultural and religious perspectives. I brought a friend of mine from Appalachia in, Paul, um, uh, excuse me, Ron, uh, Ron Penn, who's a musicologist and does shape note music, what's called shape note music. So we learned over the course of two years, we learned in this area, shape note music, which is where people sit in a circle. It's a very democratic, very Christian uh, form of music where people read out of um, a shape, a big volume of music. And um, it's very compelling music and Sufi chanting where people, excuse me, you sit in a square if you're in shape note, and you sit in a circle if you're a Sufi chanter. And we learned each other's forms and had a variety of social actions. And then over the course of three days, we did a performance in this abandoned mill where many people from this community had, or had worked. Uh, and their families had worked. And we offered tours to the community. We opened it up before it was gonna be redeveloped. And um, we allowed people to come in and watch the setup of the filming, to participate in the behind the scenes work. And then we did a performance that took place over the course of a day, which had to do with chanting and shape note music. At the end of the day, we had the biggest gathering that would, had been had in that town uh, for since the mills, basically, since people gathered to work in the mills, there were five, over 500 people, and I'm happy to say they were there were 50% Muslim and 50% um, Christian. And I would like to finish with this piece.
So that's the end of the lecture. And I'll be really happy to answer questions uh, downstairs after this talk. Thank you very much for being such an attentive audience. <laughs>